So uh, your spirit is our teacher, he's our guide, he's our leader. As we're gathered here, we dedicate all this to you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're good to go. All right, we are here at Cascadia Church. We're in Route 66. Boy, we're just getting right near the end. We're at book number 62 this morning, 1 John. So we're going to have you open your Bibles to 1 John. Five chapters, kind of a short book, but extremely practical. Extremely practical book of Scripture. Uh, Some have described 1 John like a spiritual fence, And on one side of the fence are those who have eternal life, and on the other side of the fence are those who do not have eternal life. And this fence is so high that it cannot be straddled. You can't have one foot in the kingdom and one foot out of the kingdom. So 1 John makes it very clear where you, where I stand spiritually. We are either in God's family or we are not in God's family. And 1 John is loaded with a series of tests or questions or principles that we're to look at and think about. And depending on how we answer these questions, whether or not we pass these tests, so to speak, we will know whether or not we have eternal life. We will know whether or not we have a relationship with God the Father, that we are in fellowship with Him, and that we are in fellowship with one another. And so that's why John wrote this letter. Here's how he put it. At the end, near the very end of this book, he wrote this. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that, here's the reason why. Every time you see those two words, so that, he's always going to tell you why he just said something, and it's a really important phrase. So that you may know that you have eternal life. See, that's why I wrote this letter. I want you to know have certainty, have confidence that you have eternal life. So as I said, there are several standards in this book that help us to measure our relationship with God and to determine whether or not we genuinely, truly do have eternal life. And I found a fascinating way that John does this. He's got this little method or this little technique that he uses in his writings, and I picked up on it and I'm going to use it as the, uh, the foundation or the basis for the outline that you'll see in just a moment. And he uses these two words, by this. By this. These two words joined together are found a dozen times in five chapters. It's repeated often for emphasis. And you'll see that as we work through uh, First John. You'll see that in my outline. I've always, in the key verses, I've always underlined those two words for you, by this, so that you'll be able to see quickly what he's, what he's writing, what he's doing there. So before we get into the message itself, we'll do the little summary that we like to do. Well, I like to do it every week uh, for each book of the scripture. Some of you might like it as well. I know some of you really like the cartoons. It's coming. Hang on, we saved the best for last. All right. Now, what these, these 10 word summaries I get from a little booklet that a friend of mine gave me. And so the author of that booklet put the summary of 1 John in this way. Jesus was real man, just as he is real God. Now, I just spend time talking about whether or not you have a relationship with God, whether or not you know that you have eternal life. But this particular author's emphasis is saying that the way that we know, one of the standards, one of the measurements that we know that we know God and we know that we have eternal life is you have a clear conscience about this idea. You are convinced that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man at the same time, fully God and full deity and full humanity humanity at the same time, fully human, living in the same body as God on earth, God among us. So Jesus was real man just as he is real God. The theme of the book is fellowship with God and one another. Uh, One of the key verses is this, 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that, there's those two words again, you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That's what First John is all about. Fellowship is a relationship. And it's more than just friendship. It's more than just doing things together. Sometimes fellowship is 
pleasant and joyful, maybe surrounded by a nice meal or something like that, but sometimes fellowship is hard. It's difficult. It's painful. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote about wanting to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. So it's sharing every dimension of life together. That's what fellowship is. Starts in our relationship with God, and then it works out in our relationship with one another. As Joanne and I pray for people every day, Joanne and I pray together, and when we pray for people who are struggling uh, in, in any dimension of life, we are asking God that their first problem that is fixed or the first challenge or difficulty that is fixed is their vertical relationship with God. Fix that first and then work on the horizontal or other dimensions in life. Okay, here's the cartoon you've been waiting for. You see one person, one yawn. Yep, first John. Whoa, we got a bright one in the room today. Thanks, Dennis. So what's he, what's he, what's he, Mr. Hotshot, what's he tinkering with? It's a fellowship barometer. Yeah, it's measuring the degree, or maybe a fellowship thermometer, either way, measuring the degree of fellowship, either with God or with one another. So that's what First John is all about. It's a fellowship barometer or fellowship tool, fellowship measurement. How close did you come to figuring that out this week? Not at all? Okay, all right. Okay. Well, I just keep you guessing. How many people will be yawning next week? Good, you're on it. You're sharp people out there today. Okay, let's jump into this. First John, here we go. Number one is this. My obedience to God demonstrates that I am in fellowship with God. My obedience to God demonstrates that I am in fellowship with God. First John chapter 2, verse 3. See the two words by this? By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. How do you know you have a relationship with God? You do what he says. You do what he tells you to do. This is the first, obedience is the first measurement of fellowship with God. And the first way to measure whether or not you really have eternal life. And what he's focusing on here is whether or not you're listening to God. Does what he have to say to you, does it matter? And if you're hearing him, are you doing what he is saying? You hear God when you read his word, the scriptures. You hear God when you pray. You hear God when other people speak to you about spiritual things. So John is stating simply and clearly right out of the starting gate here. If you're not obeying God, it's more than likely because you don't know him. That's a very serious spiritual problem. Or it simply could be that you know God, but you're out of fellowship with him. And John mentions that this is a dangerous place to be, to know God but not be obedient to him. Now, careful, we want to realize this. John is not saying that if you know God, you will never disobey him. He's not saying that if you know God, you will never be disobedient, that you will never sin. He's not saying that. We all sin. And we will until we are completely transformed when we see Jesus Christ, when we are ultimately glorified or sanctified, when we are completely transformed when we see Jesus. Well, what he's, he's doing is he's saying that uh, we, we need to be careful about our attitude about sin and not slip into that habit of sin or carelessness about sin. He makes this statement, 1 John 1.8, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, when we are declared righteous, when we are justified by God, he he, he declares us innocent. But that doesn't mean that we never sinned or that we have not sinned. Some people say to be justified, which means to be declared righteous, means that it's just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Not true. I mean, it's clever. It's kind of cute. But theologically, it's not really sound. We have sinned. We do sin. We will sin. And we need to be careful about that. Here's another one, chapter 3, verse 8. Those who, the one who practices sin is of the devil. In other words, if this is your habit, your lifestyle, this is your default in life, is sin. Uh, That comes from Satan. 
No one who has been born of God practices sin. He doesn't say you never sin, but sin is no longer the habit of your lifestyle. Because God's seed, the source of life, remains in him or in you, and he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. He's got a brand new life, a brand new nature, a brand new relationship. All the old is passing away. All the new is happening and it's coming. So the point, here's the point. Here's, I think, a good way to illustrate this. Before we met God, uh, sin didn't matter. In fact, sin was entertaining. Uh, Sin is something that we enjoy. Sometimes sin is what we were looking for. We created opportunities to sin. That is not characteristic of a child of God. The grace of God draws us or repels us from the desire and the fulfillment of sin, draws us away from temptation toward righteousness, toward obedience, toward God. That's the point that John is making here. You know, back before we knew Christ, sin was entertaining. We thought it was sin that was making us feel free and and carefree and all those kind of things. We just sinned whenever we wanted, not knowing that in reality we were slaves to sin. We were enslaved, we were in bondage. We didn't know it. Until we realized that it's at the cross where Jesus sets us free from the power and the penalty of sin. Not the presence of sin, but the power of sin and the penalty of sin. The presence of sin will be eliminated later down the road when we see Christ when we're with him. And so now, this is, this is really important. Now that we know God, we want to sin less. We want to be free from temptation. We want to be sin free if we can. And that's the new direction in life. Away from temptation. Uh, here's another verse in another dimension on this same kind of point. Chapter 2, verse 5. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also uh, to walk just as he walked, just as Jesus walked. When the scriptures uses that word walk in a spiritual sense, it's talking about your lifestyle. It's your lifestyle. And Jesus' lifestyle was to always obey his father. So when John says we should walk in the way that Jesus did, our desire, our focus, our passion ought to be to always be obedient to our Father. Always be obedient to God. Here's how Jesus said it. John chapter 4, verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's what sustains me, is obedience. It's a remarkable statement. I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus is not only emphasizing his focus of obedience, but he he understands why he was sent. He mentions it in all three of these verses. God sent me. And we in... The same sense, as well, in a different sense, but in a similar sense, God gave us life. He made us. He saved us. He gave us new life. And now we are sent ones to be living in obedience to God the Father. So all this is about us knowing that we know God because we want to be obedient to him. That is a desire that Christ followers have. Non-Christians don't have that desire. I didn't have that desire before I met Christ. Sin, big deal, it's fun. But now, uh, I don't like it as much. (laughs) Uh, You know, sometimes sin is pleasurable. The scripture says there's pleasure in sin, and we all sin. But it is certainly a whole different attitude than it was before I met Jesus. Here's another dimension to obedience, number two. My love for others demonstrates that I'm obedient to God. My love for others demonstrates that I am obedient to God. See chapter 3, verse 10? 
By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother and sister. I want you to see, first of all, especially as we're starting to get into election campaign cycles and all that kind of stuff, uh, we are not all children of God. You will hear probably every uh, politician running for office say, we're all God's children. We are not all God's children. We're all made in the image of God. That's a different thing. But the word of God right here says some are children of the devil and some are children of God. What's the difference? The difference is that the child of God wants to practice righteousness. I'm especially concerned when I hear people who do not practice righteousness say that we're all God's children. That's especially troubling, and at least it is for me. The difference between a child of God and a child of the devil is one lives for others and the other lives for himself or herself. Chapter 3, verse 18 reads this way, Little children, let's not love with word or tongue, but indeed in truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will set our hearts at ease before him that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Now that's a challenging verse. What does it mean? Let's unpack it. I think it's a really important verse. We need to first of all understand that the context of this verse is that we are commanded and compelled to love in deed and truth. That is God's will. It's God's will for us. And that marks the child of God. That marks the believer But there are times when our heart condemns us. For what reason? Because there are times when we do not love in word or deed. There are times when we do not love other people the way that we ought to. And our heart condemns us when we are disobedient or when we fall short. That's the point that John is making in these verses here. The reason our heart condemns us at times is because we know that we've failed. And it's self-judgment. Our heart is condemning us. But I want you to see this. God is greater than our hearts. He's greater than our hearts. This word greater, the, the, the Greek word, the literal word is mega. Mega. And sometimes it's, it's translated big as it is here or greater. But sometimes it's also translated louder. And that's how I want you to hear that word this morning. God is louder than our heart. That's a legitimate translation. And so the the point of what I'm I'm focusing on here is whatever your heart, listen carefully, whatever your heart is saying to you, listen to God instead because the heart is deceitful. The book of Jeremiah says it's wicked. It's sick. And it deceives us. We talked recently about the danger of following your heart, listening to your heart. No, you listen to the word of God. You listen to the voice of God instead. And as you do, when you know that you're to love one another in word and deed, and we fall short of that, and we have a tendency to to condemn ourselves or to judge ourselves or to be hard on ourselves, and our, and our heart is condemning us, I uh, need to realize that God never condemns his children. He will convict them, and he will comfort them, he will rebuke them, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the word of God says. So if you listen to what God says about your failures, here's, here's what you're going to hear. This is the Lloyd paraphrase, okay? So you got to Got to work with me a little bit. When you tell God about your failures, I think what you're going to hear from him is he's going to say, I'm glad you know that you failed. Because I know that too. I know everything about you and I still love you. I know who you are and there's nothing you can do that is hidden from me, ever. Don't try to hide it. It doesn't work. You can't do that. 
I know that you're struggling because you failed. And I'm glad you're struggling. Because that shows me you're uncomfortable with your failure and you would rather succeed. See, this is the heart of a father, a compassionate father. And he says, the reason it matters to you when you fail is because you want to do better. That's why our heart condemns us, because we know we can do better. We know we should have done better. And if you continue to listen to God, he's going to say things to you like, I'm here to help you because I love you. That's the voice you want to hear. That's the voice of God. So your love for others will demonstrate your obedience to God. And, and when we don't do that, when we fail, um, the fact that your heart condemns you shows you, demonstrates to you that you want to be obedient. If you didn't know Christ, it wouldn't matter. Who cares? But if you know Jesus, it matters. And your heart is condemning you. But listen instead to the voice of God. So don't be hard on yourself. I often say, I often say to people when I, struggle, when, when I talk with them about struggles and failures and things, I say, say, learn from it. But then turn from it. That's why Jesus often told people, I forgive you. Now stop sinning. Go. Sin no more. You're free. See, that is the heart of God. The heart of man is so different. Our hearts are so different. We will continue to judge ourselves, condemn ourselves, ostracize ourselves, or ostracize others, whatever it might be. That is not the love of God. It's not the love of God. The love of God motivates us to love others. And that's what we've seen here at this idea. Let's take a look at number three. God's love for me compels me to love others. God's love for me compels me to love others. Chapter 3, verse 16. We know love by this. Did he lay down his life for us? And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. Uh, Laying down one's life for another person is the ultimate demonstration of love. And it's rare. It's a rare sacrifice. We know that often uh, our military personnel will lay down down their lives for you and for me. And we are so grateful that they love us that much. Occasionally, a police officer or a first responder will lay down his or her life for those that he or she is trying to rescue. I think about 9-11 and all the first responders that lost their lives trying to help others. Laying down one's life is the ultimate sacrifice. And love often requires sacrifice. Look at the next verse. It's not coincidental that he puts the next verse next. Whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? It's not a random or arbitrary statement that he makes right after 316. These two ideas are connected. You know, some might say that they're willing to lay down their life, but they find it extremely difficult to lay down five dollars. That's what John's saying here. You can say you're willing to lay down your life all you want, but if you see somebody with a need and you don't do anything about it, even a simple physical need, how can you say the love of God is in your heart? You know, I think about this idea. And I remember that back five years ago, Joanne and I were in Blyville, Arkansas, where my dad was born, spent the first few years of his life. Pulled into the hotel, and there's a truck in the parking lot with his hood up, and somebody stuck a $5 bill in the windshield wiper just to help him out a little bit financially with whatever it's going to cost to fix your truck. And I thought, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Somebody just helping a stranger, just being a neighbor, even if it's just a little bit. I'm sure it helped the person that owned the truck, but it sure impacted me. I've never done this, but maybe I should someday. 
But it's the idea here. That's exactly what John is saying. If you've got the capacity to help and you can, you should. Isn't that what Jesus did? Of course. He's our example. And even something simple can be transformational. So, interesting connection here between loving others and obeying God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and follow his commandments. So all these ideas that we've been talking about are woven together in this verse throughout this letter. I had a student approach me one time. I have an opportunity to teach in a couple of different places, a couple of different schools, short term, different places, different times. Student came up to me one time and said, we don't know each other that well, uh, but I know you love us uh, because God told you to come here and teach us and you did what God told you to do. And, and I know that you love us. That's why you're here is because you love us. I thought, wow. So it's the love that God has for us that compels us to love others. To pay it forward, so to speak. The generosity and the grace and the mercy that he's given to us, it's our turn to, to share that with others. Final thought, number four, the ministry of the Trinity helps me, uh, keeps me secure. The ministry of the Trinity. We know by this that he remains in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the Trinity is God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, three separate beings existing as one God. And not only Christ lives in us, but the Holy Spirit lives within every person who has a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Francis Chan wrote a book called The Forgotten God, and it's about the Holy Spirit. And he is often neglected. I am in the practice right now of trying to develop even more closely my relationship with the Holy Spirit, my conversations with the Holy Spirit. And often I need to tell him, I'm just so sorry I've left you out for all these decades. But he is just as much God as Jesus and the Father, and he lives inside of me. And he wants to have just as strong, just a vital, just a dynamic relationship with him as I have with the Father and with Jesus Christ as well. 1 John 4, 13. 4, 13. Uh, by this we know that we remain in him and he in us because he is given to us by his spirit or of his spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he keeps me secure. Another verse of scripture says that he is the pledge or the promise of the inheritance that we will receive. And the, the word is also, the idea behind that word is it's like a, an engagement ring. I gave one to Joanne when we decided, she eventually agreed that we would get married. And that was our commitment. That ring symbolized our commitment until we were married. And the spirit of God who lives within us is a symbol in the presence of his promise to be faithful to us and bring us home eternally where we will be with him forever. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So we've got the Trinity in this verse again. And it's all talking about how we can know that we have eternal life. How that we can know we have a relationship with God. <clears throat> now in John's day, there was a growing number of people who were denying that Jesus Christ was a real person, a real flesh and blood person. A lot of people were emphasizing, oh, he's just an idea. He's just the ideal person, but he wasn't real. And that's why John began his letter in this way. First couple of verses. What was from the beginning, eternal. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. And John just launches with this idea that, look, he, he's not just an ideal. He's not just an idea. 
he was, he's a very real human being and I heard him and I touched him and I had conversations with him and all these kinds of things. So I want to finish with how the ministry of the Trinity keeps us secure in our relationship with God, chapter 4, verse 9. By this, the love of God was revealed in us that God has sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him. So it's the love of God that gives us physical life. The love of God gives us spiritual life. Um, I had a conversation recently with a man who believes in God and the universe and those things. Listen, the universe has never done anything for you. Nothing. The universe is, is, is a created entity. It's inanimate. It doesn't have a will of its own. Uh, the, the universe did not give you life. We are not here by just some random accident that people call evolution. No. The eternal God chose to make you and me and to give us physical life and to give us spiritual life. And so uh, he is the only source of physical and spiritual life. And he keeps us. He keeps us secure. So it brings us to our takeaway for this morning. Suggested takeaway, 1 John 4, 13. We know that we remain in him and he in us. We know this. Eternal life is eternal. Eternal life is not temporary, and I hope you make it through the rest of it, whatever it might be. You know, eternal means eternal. He uses that phrase eternal life several times in this letter. So God is the one who holds us. However, he's given us a free will and we have the propensity to wander at times. Don't wander. Don't do that. It's not worth it. He loves you so much. He wants to embrace you. He wants to hold you. He wants to stay near. He wants you to stay near. Let him draw you near. Stay near. Enjoy his relationship. Enjoy the fellowship. The alternative is devastating and damaging and just a waste of time, a waste of eternity. So enjoy the presence and the love of God today, tomorrow, every day of your life, into eternity. And John says you can know whether or not you have that. If you have the Son, you have life. Let's pray. Father, you, the eternal God, and you, Jesus, and you, Spirit of God, have always existed. And in your plan, you chose to create the universe out of nothing and to give life to each one of us. And you desire to give eternal life to anyone who will say yes to what Jesus did for us at the cross. In your word, the scriptures, the Bible make it very clear that once we say yes, we transfer out of life into death, out of darkness into light, out of death into life, out of darkness into light. And uh, we know you and you live within us forever. And that will never change. And we're grateful that we have that confidence. We're grateful we have that assurance. We want to sing about that. We want to celebrate your love for us. The desire that you have to be intimate with us, to spend time with us personally, corporately, whatever that might be, at whatever time and whatever way. So thank you, Father, for loving us the way that you do. Thank you that we get to sing to you and with one another about that. Receive this as our just one of the ways that we tell you, Father, that we love you. Jesus, that we love you. Spirit of God, that we love you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye to everybody. Here we go.